necessarily, whether accidental or on purpose, the school forms a wedge between the child and the parent. So you drop your kid off at school uh, and you say, here, here you go, you pat him on the butt, you know, off you go. <laughs> the school knows better than mommy. And then the kid comes home and he's been told something that maybe you disagree with. Guess who's gonna win that battle? The school will. Our response to coronavirus offers three great lessons, namely our flawed logic, our compromised values, and our education system's tragic, multi-generational failure. Sam Sorbo is a filmmaker, radio host, actress and model. She hosts the Sam Sorbo Show and is author of the new book, Words for Warriors, Fight Back Against Crazy Socialists and the Toxic Liberal Left, which is a number one bestseller on Amazon. How are you, Sam? Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. It's a number one bestseller on Amazon. I, I, I don't know if they actually know that because it seems to me <laughs> they would want to take it down really fast. Well, they actually took down um, a couple of our books before, Ezra Levant's book about uh, China and our prime minister was taken down, only to be put back up, and then the audio book taken down. They're not sure where they are on all of this. So, um, if I don't know if you remember, but we first spoke two years ago. You had me on your radio show, I think, in 2019, which I really appreciated. And obviously, I've I've upgraded since then, so I'm always appreciative of you. I'm always happy to talk to you, and I enjoy what you say a lot. And the first thing I wanted to get into was what you've spoken a lot about, understandably, most recently, about schooling and parenting during the COVID lockdowns. And it's something that I've heard you speak about in a few videos um, when, I, when I searched you out. So it's about the wedge that stu uh, schools are putting between parents and their students. And I think it's a very interesting topic in terms of the authority that they have. So I wanted to play a clip and I wanted you to explain it uh, right after we get to it. Justin, can we throw that up, please? Necessarily, whether accidental or on purpose, the school forms a wedge between the child and the parent. So you drop your kid off at school uh, and you say, here, here you go, you pat him on the butt, you know, off you go. <laughs> the school knows better than mommy. And then the kid comes home and he's been told something that maybe you disagree with. Guess who's going to win that battle? The school will. And then the kid thinks mommy's dumb because the school told me this thing and mommy thinks this thing. And so they, they, you know, the kid comes home with a piece of paper, mom, you have to sign this. Daddy, you have to sign this. <laughs> Sign this permission so I can do the thing that the school wants to do. And you sign it and you go right under the authority of the school in your child's eyes. Hmm. It's, it's not, it just is. There's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. That's the way that it is. But then when the child becomes a teenager and you're saying stuff that the child doesn't necessarily want to adhere to or whatever, your authorities have been undermined. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah. So, yeah. Sam, I, I saw you talk about that a few times, and to me this makes a lot of sense, but it's not something that I've ever actually heard anyone point out, I think. How did you think of this concept, and what's an example that you can think of uh, that really affects a child's relationship with their, with their parent, uh, where their authority is taken away? Well, first of all, I want to point out I do own more than one shirt, and I wish I'd seen the clip before I Oh, are you wearing the same that. shirt? Okay, it wasn't filmed today. It was not. And it has been washed in between. OK, so uh, where because this is a very serious topic and um, I'm going to elaborate on it a little bit further, because um, the, the more that I think about this, the more it becomes clear to me um, when the child goes home with that permission slip and you sign the permission slip, your authority is undermined because you are sub subjecting your authority to the school's authority. And that is something that the child doesn't miss. That it, it might seem like, well, what's the child? He's not going to. No, no, because it, it goes on and on and on. And so the school sends home the reading homework. And mommy, you have to sign my reading log because if you don't sign it, then I don't get to, you know, go out and play or I don't get, you know, I don't get the gold star that all the other kids get. And it, there's a concerted effort. Now, I'm not saying that it's nefariously intentioned, although to some degree, um, the entire system is, okay? Uh, the entire system is geared against the parent, and we're seeing that more and more. In fact, I just had somebody on my podcast today talking about the parental bill of rights that they're trying to pass here in Florida. There are several states who have, that have already passed it. Why would we need a parental bill of rights 
because there are people out there like Harris Perry uh, saying, you know, we have to get away from this ar arcane idea that children belong to their parents. Children belong to the society at large. Uh. <laughs> no, no, they don't. No, they don't. And so to elaborate further, parents are in the position of saying, oh my gosh, so I have a full-time caregiver that's free called public school and I don't have to even, you know, think about my kid all day. And, and yes, sadly, there are parents who sort of approach it that way. Um, and I feel, I feel sad for them because yes, there's a, there's a built-in babysitter in the schools, but the parents don't understand what they're sacrificing when they commit their children into an institution that does not have the child's best interests at heart. And you cannot make an argument that the schools care more about the children than about money, about teachers' interests, about the administrators' interests. Uh, you just can't make that argument. That argument just falls flat on its face. Um, so, so that's so that's sort of where I come off with that. And and by the way, it's it's. So so I know you and I sort of grew up and and we heard parents say, "Ugh, teenagers, what can you do?" You know, well I can show you what you do. If you homeschool, you will never roll your eyes and say teenagers, <laughs> because my teenagers love and respect me, and I love and respect them. And if we have a disagreement, we speak about it like civilized individuals. There is no slamming the door. There is no spending all hours outside of the house at night. Like like that just isn't something that, that is even a thing in my house. And I know plenty of, of homeschool houses that are like that. Now I'm not saying that homeschool is the, uh, panacea that no homeschooled kids ever rebelled. Of course not. Every parent is different. Every child is different. Relationships are different, but if you want a scenario wherein your child is less likely to rebel, do not turn them over to a separate authority for eight hours a day. Now, do you think that, like, let's talk about North America, for example. Do you think we should be completely moving towards eliminating public schools? And if so, do you think there should be a standardized testing for uh, an, an application to colleges or afterwards? Or how, how do you see the perfect system being? <laughs> well, I think first we have to eliminate colleges. <laughs> Okay, all kidding aside, <laughs> uh, the public schools don't have children's best interests at heart, and they are government schools. If you want a child to believe in, uh, in uh, Catholic orthodoxy, send them to a Catholic school because the Catholic school will teach Catholicism. The, uh, the Jewish school will teach Judaism. The Muslim school will teach Islam. The government school teaches government. That's really interesting. So I've I... never heard anyone, that makes a lot of sense. I've never heard anyone put it uh, that way before. And Right, so, so mm -hmm. do I think that we should have government schools? Absolutely not. It's a conflict of interest. Well, my brother See, personally is, uh, he has nine children, they're Catholic, and he homeschooled, him and his wife homeschooled them all, which is very interesting. They don't even want, uh, an overarching authority of, I. this is my opinion of what they think, obviously they might have a different answer, but they might not even want a overarching authority of what they teach at a Catholic school, for example. So I think well, that's very interesting. Well, perhaps they read the Bible. And <laughs> the Bible's do. very clear that the parents are the educators for the children. In, in I think two or three cases, it mentions that grandparents also are tasked with teaching their grandchildren. But, um, but in general, the, the Bible's very clear the government has no authority to teach, to educate, has no no call to educate, and neither does the church, frankly. What do you think is the earliest example that you can think of or remember of some sort of indoctrinational concept or pu public policy concept, uh, ethical concept that was pushed in the public school system that you can remember in your lifetime? What do you, what's your first memory of when, that? When, when was it not pushed? that's the idea that that things are not pushed in the public schools is ridiculous. I mean, I remember when I went to school and I had a teacher who, and I was an atheist, I was raised in a fairly atheist household and I had a teacher who pushed God on me. Uh, teachers push their personal 
beliefs and views and all kinds of things. Um, d- does the school do it uh, systemically? Yes, that's because there is a system that is now applied to the schools. Common Core put that on on full full afterburners. Uh, and so now we have full Marxist indoctrination in our schools, whereas before it was just a little bit. School itself is a is a socialist proposition. We take money from the community at large and we funnel it to just the people's children and the, the, and the teachers that serve in the in the commune. Uh, but but that's you know in and of itself it's a socialist in, endeavor. I think you're dropping a lot of red pills on people right now that they probably haven't heard before. Do you hear a lot from uh, students or parents about the stuff that's being pushed now? Do you get a lot of feedback about that? I do. Uh, specifically, particularly the pornography that's in the classroom. I have a I have a gal who reached out to me and we've been sort of doing a session now and then on the phone uh, because I, I also offer coaching for, for parents and um, I'm I'm doing, I'm, anyway, so we get on the phone together and she is just at her wits end because she sees the amount of pornography and it's not even the amount. It's just the fact that pornography exists and they're pushing it on ninth graders, 10th graders. So in the it's classroom. actual, por- sorry to cut you off, but it's, a- like, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about actual like porno videos or like images? What exactly uh, does that mean specifically? Right now it's very, very much in the literature. The imagery is reserved to uh, grade schoolers where, and, and I wouldn't say that that's, I, I, you probably wouldn't call it porn, but it's it, for, for kindergarten, first grade, second grade, some of the books that they are pushing on kids have anatom- uh, anatomically correct drawings of the human form in ways that are not appropriate in a school setting. It's not that kids shouldn't learn about their human body. It's that it brings up questions between the child and the teachers that are not appropriate. Hmm. Um, but I, I had, gosh, this is going back a little bit. Years ago, I had a young woman on my program and we did a, an extensive interview. She had stepped out of a classroom. She was given a poem and this was an English lit class and the poem was supposed to show how controversy can be. And it was a pornogra- it was a homosexual, violent, pornographic poem with replete with uh, cuss words, uh, uh, all kinds of um, cuss words. And so the teacher stood in the 27 year old teacher stood in front of this 10th grade class and he in, he told them what the cuss words were because even the publisher had not published, the poem with all the foul language in it. And she was offended. um, And she actually admitted to me that she felt violated, that she was exposed to visuals that she was unprepared to see. Wow. And so her dad kept her out uh, of school and they petitioned the school for redress and they wanted an apology and they wanted the poem removed. And the school said, okay, we'll, we'll provide you with an apology letter, which of course from the professor was a sorry, not sorry letter. And then they said, but you know what? The poem stays. And I said to the young woman, correct me if I'm wrong, we scheduled this interview early because you have to get to class. So are you back in school? And she said, yes. And her father said to me, we're so proud of her. We allowed her to make the decision herself. She's, she's 16. 15, 16, we allowed her to make the decision herself. And yes, she's back in the classroom with that professor and she's sitting next to uh, an atheist girl and she actually has the opportunity to, you know, minister to her. And I'm, I'm like, so you're willing to sacrifice your daughter because I said to her, so what message do you think that sends the other students in the class? And she thought about it. She didn't have an answer. I said, do you think it might send them the message that um, Christians are easily cowed away from their beliefs, that they roll over easily, that uh, that they don't, that their beliefs actually don't have any merit? When you step back into the classroom with a professor who you, your words, violated you and dad, 
And by the way, I, I didn't take him on on air because uh, I don't believe in that. But but after he got off the air, I, I couldn't help myself. What kind of father allows his daughter who admits that she felt violated, admits that this and he knows that this is completely inappropriate behavior. What kind of father allows that young woman to be exposed to this kind of I, I don't have a good word for the for the behavior of the professor, frankly. It, it escapes me. It's not chicanery. It's, it's much worse than that. <laughs> You're right? nicer than I, are, than I am, Sam. And abuse. For, abuse. Uh, Let's just say he's an abuser. And for those who may not particularly believe you um, uh, on stuff that's being pushed in classrooms, I have a good example from up here in Canada where the person who wrote the, one of the curriculums in Ontario turned out to be a registered sex offender. So this was a person who actually wrote what uh, students should be learning. Uh, something the, problem is, the problem is you have no idea who the teachers are. You're trusting that the government mm -hmm. institution has fully vetted every teacher and somehow magically chooses, like, like you know, we're, we're a society that's, oh, put your faith in science. And yet we somehow magically, the, the, the system chooses the right teacher for your child it's absurd on its face. And yet I think we've just been grandfathered into this mm -hmm. because this is the way it's been done for decades and it's wrong and it's dangerous. And, you know, for every story that you tell, I have a story in the States, the, the kindergarten teacher who managed to finagle uh, getting the classroom that had its own toilet so he could film the children in the bathroom unbeknownst to anybody. And they only found out when the feds raided his apartment because of a drug bust and they found all of the, what they call child porn images, but what I refer to as crime scene photos. And this individual was teaching, was teaching, instructing young children. If you think that they are not trying to groom children for the sex trafficking trade in our schools, you need to do more research because the, the idea of lubrication should not be something that is spoken of to a second grader, and yet it is. That's very disturbing, <laughs> very disturbing to say the least. I laugh because it makes me uncomfortable. Um, something I want to shift to- Love that. <laughs> <laughs> something I want to shift to, be, it's still involving schools, but more the COVID-centric stuff is, um, you talk a lot of stuff, you talk a lot about not reopening schools to, until they're safe, the flatten the curve argument, and the overall shifting of the goalposts um, that is something that I saw you talk about in a lot of, of your videos. Now let me show a clip of you, um, a video called Lessons from COVID-19, and I want to get uh, your reaction from this. Our response to coronavirus offers three great lessons, namely our flawed logic, our compromised values, and our education system's tragic multi-generational failure. We notably neglected to anticipate the adverse effects school closings would have on the nation's children, not to mention the adults. In reopening, we will likely make the same mistake because these days we blindly advance toward a desired outcome without regard to collateral damages. We shut down the entire U.S. economy to flatten the curve and then seamlessly shifted to finding a vaccine well, flattening the curve intended to slow the spread, not minimize cases. Nobody wants needless death, but this classic bait and switch deliberately killed logic. And now we must reopen schools because the kids need school so badly. One ought to ask, if only because we failed to do so before, at what cost? The forum guests didn't consider cost, Children need the social environment of schools. Oh, but forgive me, I thought this meeting was about education. And given the new safety protocols, what exactly are the social benefits on offer? Focusing on the social argument to advocate for education defies logic. It seems wrongheaded, but that is the state of our brain trust. The forum featured several heads of schools and schooling is their business, in effect, I love the the set there. I love the format of these videos. I watched so many of them the last couple of days. And I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think is the primary reason behind the goalpost shifting? Is it a money grab for bigger business, which is something I learned, uh, lean towards, uh, the power grab from politicians? Or are they just, uh, somebody, someone might make the argument, are they afraid of making the wrong 
decision and looking bad for it. I would reference Governor Cuomo made really bad decisions. He might not have had it. He's already super rich. I think maybe he just was covering up his bad decisions. Uh, what do you think of the primary reason? Is it in, if you can group it into a general sense uh, across the governments? I have to question whether it's uh, if effect, an effective strategy to try to outguess what the left is trying to do. I think it all has to do with control. Control typically has to do with power and money. Uh, uh, Cuomo made enormous mistakes. Nobody's holding him accountable except, uh, you know, the, the, the right wing sites. Um, I don't think that they're afraid of making mistakes. If you, if you are in the left, the media will leave you alone. And if you are not among the left, then the media will attack you for doing the right thing. And so they're just, they're, to my mind, it's all about control. Um, and, and since I made that video, you know, we, we said flatten the curve. That was in order to, to slow the spread, in order to allow our medical professionals a uh, breathing room to treat the people who needed treatment. Mm -hmm. Now, the WHO just halved the number of cases, uh, the number of deaths. They just cut it in half. Uh, the CDC is revising their figures. And we're still in this weird, um, this weird twilight zone while where we're trying to quote, slow the spread, but slow the spread. Why slow the spread? Why not speed the spread? I'm not saying we should speed the spread. I'm just saying, why didn't we even ask the question? And so that whole video was pointing to the fact that, that we had this big round table under president Trump, mind you. And, and by the way, I'm a big Trump fan. So this wasn't to, to castigate him. I just needed to ask, why are we so desperate to, quote, get kids back in school for social reasons when school should be about education? And this is really, I'm going to get uh, emotional now because this is really the crux of the issue. Because you have parents out there who think that their children are getting educated and there is no education happening in our public schools right now. Very little, okay? It is called schooling for a reason. It is not, they are not engaged in the process of education. They are not even interested in the definition of education, which incidentally used to be the pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness, and now is simply the pursuit of getting some information into a little mind so that they can reiterate that information uh, properly. It is not engaged in teaching children how to think. It is only engaged in teaching them what to think. And so when they talk about, but, but, but it, it, all of that goes by the wayside because all they're saying they're interested in is socialization, which should have nothing to do with education, frankly. Very little. A little bit, but very little. What, um, what would you say to, to the person who would argue, well, they, they need this socialization. They don't get this at home. What, what's your solution for, for that question? Well, you know, I'm a home educator. My oldest son is a, is a huge, hugely gregarious very social kid. He, at this point, he has, he has friends all over the world. I say, don't give them the crutch of school. If you want me to put it so bluntly, th there are other options. We don't send our children to school for socialization. That's a misnomer. That's a bait and switch. Again, it's a bait and switch. Education should be about education. And if it turns into something that's that's more predominantly about socialization, which it has, then it's no longer education. Then send the kids for, to school for social time, but educate them at home, if that's what we're talking about. But don't try to tell me that, that putting masks on children and separating them with plexiglass and not allowing them to play on the playing field on the, you know, mm -hmm. uh, at recess and not allowing them to have lunchtime together, now that's about socialization. That's about conditioning. You're making almost too much sense here, Sam. And, and I'm uh, terribly sorry. I get very, I, no. I get very aggravated about this because I have so many parents say, "Well, I just want the social aspect for my kids," and I go, "Okay, so you don't mind that they're stupid?" I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, please think, use your brain, wrap around it, and don't just blindly go for the, you know, the 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 oh squirrel. You were alluding to what I wanted to talk about next. Justin, we could throw up some of those graphics while we talk about it. We've got, I don't know if this one was real. <laughs> Somebody said that this was from an actual school where they're doing, uh, obviously, a music class. And then there's a video 
of the plexiglass between one of, my, one of the writers here tweeted this out where it's like, and, and what I wanted to ask you is what long-term effects do you think that this is going to have on children? The masking, they obviously can't see each other. When you're in school and the teacher says, don't talk, uh, don't interact, you still find ways to do it anyways. But in, in these uh, coffins <laughs> that they're putting them in, plexiglass uh, fish tanks, you literally can't, in, in the one that we showed, you can't turn around and look at somebody and even motion to some <laughs> motion something to them. What do you think this is going to have an effect? How do you think this is going to affect children long term when either their options are go to school, like you said, and not actually socialize or stay at home and, you know, have this Zoom call on in the background while you turn around and play PlayStation, which I know that's exactly what I would do if I was in high school now. And they said, just turn this on and listen, and it's going to be printed out for you anyways. So you're going to get a slide of it anyways. What effects do you think this is going to have on children? So it used to be that um, schools, that there were a few kids in school who really thrived, like, like they really loved it. And then there was a bunch of kids that it really wasn't the, the milieu for them. It, it just, it didn't work for them. They were either social outcasts or they, they just didn't enjoy it or they were introverts and it was too much for their, for them to take in and, and stuff like that. And unfortunately we, we've come Literally, we, we haven't come any further from that. And so now what we're doing is we're forcing all these kids into these weird boxes. I mean, this looks like really a, a torture thing from a science fiction movie. In fact, I just watched a movie. I didn't watch the whole movie and I can't remember the name, but they had kids that apparently maybe they were infected with some weird virus or something. And so they had to keep them locked down. So they wheeled them around in wheelchairs and instructed them um, but if they, if anyway, it, it, it's, it looks like medieval torture stuff. It just looks so bad. And yet we are so brainwashed into think, and we are, we're brainwashed by the schools. And I'll, let me, let me say this. Parents say to me, I could never homeschool. Parents say to me, oh my gosh, you're a goddess for homeschooling. What a sacrifice. It is not a sacrifice. You're sacrificing your children. You have no idea what you're sacrificing. You think I'm sacrificing? You have no idea what you're sacrificing when you send your children away from you to be ed to be indoctrinated away from your values. If you believe in your values, why would you cons uh, cons construct whatever the word you know send your children to be indoctrinated away from those values to believe that government is God? which is what they teach kids in school, which is why somehow we think, well, the government has all the answers. Look around you. The, the, um, the infection rate in California with all their lockdowns and all their masking mandates is the same as Florida with, no, with limited, very limited lockdowns and no masking mandates. It's the same. You tell me, the, the New York, the worst, worst possible example you could you could find for COVID management, and yet somehow DeSantis is the one on trial, and we have similar populations, except that Florida has a more aging population, so arguably our numbers mm -hmm. should be higher than New York's. And New York had the the most Chinese style lockdowns where they're coming and to these, travelers' right, doors. And, <laughs> and these are the people who are saying, you know, we have to follow the science at the same time that they're saying that there's 56 genders. It's true. So, you know, we we it is true. There are 56 genders. I know. <laughs> oh, no, um, no, but we you, uh, we have to put on our come on, folks. We got to put on our thinking caps and really try to try to think our way around this mess. It's a mess now. Um, there's a there's a word. I know we haven't gotten to my book yet, but this is my book. It just came out. Words for Warriors. Number one on Amazon. Incredibly. Um, but I'm incredibly thankful. And I go in this book. I talk about it's basically in a sense, it's a glossary. It's a reference book for people because the left has been taking our words and perverting them for decades since since after World War II, frankly, when they managed to to start us thinking that somehow fascism was right wing. Fascism fascism is not right wing, not not in the least. There is no such thing as a right wing fascist. That is an oxymoron, and I stress the moron part of that. Um, 
fascism is left wing. They have the same tactics, very violent. They have the same artwork. They have the same color scheme, black and red. I mean, so, but somehow we've bought into this idea that fascism's right wing. And so what I'm saying to folks is we have to, we have to wake up now and we have to start paying attention because they've been doing this for decades and we're just following along blindly thinking somehow it'll all work out okay. It's not working out okay. The majority of students now think that the majority of you know high school graduates believe that socialism is the best way forward. That's that's insanity. Show me anywhere where socialism has worked, and yet they somehow think that it's going to work. It can't work. It never has worked. It will not work. And if you think that it'll work, then prove to me that you are not selfish in any way, shape, or form, because the antidote to socialism or the uh, the kryptonite for socialism is selfishness. And that's why socialism, communism, Marxism will never work. It's true. And to, to your point about um, the children in masks, you were mentioning uh, this one person being an abuser of their child. I, I personally, I think that if you're sending your kid to, uh, to school to be one of these things, that's child abuse, putting a mask on them every single day when statistically there's no reason for that. I would wager that. Sad. I would call that child very- abuse again. It's very sad. Um, it's hard to call. I, 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 hmm. I want to agree with you. I have a hard time calling it child abuse when it's completely unintentional because people just don't know any better. Yeah, um, but at I, what point do we do we? At have what a... point are they guilty of not knowing any exactly. better? Exactly. I, I, I agree with you. I, I struggle with it. I have too many friends who blithely put masks on their children and send them off to school. And here's the other problem for young kids. You know, there's a whole uh, transition period where young people learn how to how to map the human face and how to figure out how to how to discern what um, facial expressions mean. When you're masking in front of a young child, you're preventing them from a very important social development milestone. Okay, and in fact, autistic children uh, in general lack the ability to to figure that stuff out. And so that's something that they have to actually like really work at learning later on. Oh, was that sarcasm? I I didn't quite understand it because they never learned how to Mm. do the facial mapping. Well, we're gonna prevent a whole generation from facial mapping and nobody's talking about the ramifications. And this is my problem. You can't just implement an idea and not at least Try to figure out what the what the ramification, what the what the adverse effects are going to be. In fact, Thomas Sowell wrote about this. He he when he was studying economics, he turned in his paper. He said to the teacher, to the professor, um, "This is you know this is the path forward. This is the uh, the the proffered solution to the problem that was given." And the teacher said, "Okay." And then what happens? And so he went and he figured out, "Okay, what are the ramifications for the solution that that the solution is going to cause?" And he brought it back to the teacher and the teacher said, okay, good. And then what happens? You can't be thinking, these people are playing checkers. They're playing chess as if it's checkers. They're playing chess as if it's not even a game. They're just doing stuff. Shut the economy down, just shut (laughs) it down. I did a whole story the other day about a young man who was like class valedictorian. He was, you know, captain of, of the track team. He was um, captain of the debate team. Uh, he was uh, lead in the Music Man musical uh, uh, in the school. Like he was like aces. This kid was so accomplished and the shutdown killed him and he took his own life. Nobody gave any, any consideration to how the shut, we've got people who are losing their livelihoods because of the stupid shutdown. And nobody seems willing to, to in government anyway, it seem, you know, with with market exceptions, seems willing to to step up and say no. In Italy, you had all of the restaurateurs get together and say, guys, we're going to die if we don't open because they were prevented from opening. They said they'll shut us down if we do. Let's just open and see what happens. And it was so many that opened on the same day. The Italian government said, you know what? Uh, we can't shut them down. We can't arrest them. So I guess restaurants can be open now. We just have to, you know, it, you started this by uh, by mentioning how, you know, we we feed off each other, right? Conservatives need to band together 
like the left does. The left is extraordinarily um, uh, well organized and conservatives need to organize. We need to support each other. We need to uh, reach out to each other. And we also need to understand that the enemy that we are fighting now is an enemy that is out for violence and for blood. We have to understand that. That's why I wrote the book. So I have to talk briefly about my book. The reason that I wrote this book is because the left has been taking our language and perverting it. And that is that accomplishes two goals. One, it makes language uh, worthless. It, it completely degrades the value of language. And two, it shuts us up. So I call it liberal fascism. The, the idea that we have, um, um, what's the word for, uh, uh, sorry, um, political correctness is, is fascism of language. You may say this, you may not say that. You may only say this in this context. That's fascism. And it's fascism of language. And they've been doing this for a very long time. And the, the upshot of that is when, when we run out of words, what, what do we say to kids when they're you know, going to act out and, and hit somebody? No, no, no. Use your words. Use your words, honey. Use your words. Right? What do we say when we want to avoid war? Let's try diplomacy. What's diplomacy? Conversation, debate, uh, argumentation. It is communication with words. That's what diplomacy is. Okay? When we no longer can communicate with words, when we are silenced by the left to such a degree, violence will be the only answer. And that's what they want. That's why the left insists on silence. That's why they scream for tolerance. You can't argue with me. You must tolerate whatever I say. And by the way, they scream for tolerance because the thing that is the most intolerant that we have is the truth. And that's how you know they're lying. The moment somebody says, no, you have to tolerate this, you know they're lying. And by the way, they know they're lying. Because Let's, gravity never asks you for tolerance. Gravity just is. It's the truth. That's something I ask all the time is, are they telling the truth or are they willingly lying or just uh, bad at their job? I'm going to have to cut off our YouTube segment there before we move behind the paywall. SamSorbo.com. Everybody, we're going to go to RebelNewsPlus.com and we're going to sign up for just $8 a month so you can see the rest of the interview. We're going to talk about the criticism you faced, um, if any. I hope not, uh, for your comments on coronavirus <laughs> and civil disobedience, as well as your husband's Facebook page being taken down. So go to rebelnewsplus.com and you'll see the rest of the interview. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you for watching, Andrew Says. If you want to see the full uncut version, go to rebelnewsplus.com and sign up today so you can see the entire episode where we talk about topics we can't show you on YouTube. They'll ban us.